Hi, I'm Jörg. Welcome to my channel. Today I'd like to take you on a tour of my CNC router that I built five years ago. And I'd like to tell you about some of the difficulties I had with it and some of the things I absolutely love. So coming right up. A CNC router is a great tool for your shop. It opens so many more possibilities. And I certainly have not regret to build one. However, I did not build the machine from scratch or basically saying that I came up with the design. I went online and I picked the designs that I liked at the time and I bought that kit. Now, could you make that from a drawing? Absolutely. Do I recommend that you start designing your own machine? Absolutely not. Um, I rather would suggest that you take a design that is proven, maybe it's an open source, and five or six or 10 or 20 people have already built that so that you can learn from their mistakes and don't have costly errors in your build. The next thing is to keep in mind what you want to do with the machine. For me, it was woodworking. And while I initially thought so, I had projects like a wooden clock, uh, um, like the see-through skeleton clock mechanic that was really intriguing to me. Making boxes where you have engravings or inlays on the top lid of the box. Um, ultimately, one of the projects I enjoyed the most was making a lithophane of a nice picture of my wife and I. And it made a great gift and any lithophane that I made and I gave it away to somebody, it was always this wow effect and people love it. And so inlays is another one that you could easily make. This is an inlay, uh, it's a epoxy filled, it sparkles a bit. And it's just, this was a test, it's just carved in poplar. Um, but keep in mind, ask yourself, what is it that I want to do? Because that determines a lot of the footprint and the accuracy of your machine. Well, I said that initially I wanted to do woodworking or the thoughts came around the woodworking. But what happened is that I picked up a customer and that customer ordered parts that I made in plastic. And it's a special plastic, it's an industrial material called Delrin. The material itself is acetal and looks like this. It's available in white and black. It's very, very strong and actually makes great, great parts um, for all the kinds and sorts of things around the house. Um, over the years I have made 3,000, over 3,000 parts and my machine has lasted good and it has very good accuracy as well. Now, can you build a business around a CNC router given that you learn all of the aspects of it? Absolutely yes, you can. That's what you want to do. Let's talk about a couple of features that you want to consider when designing, purchasing, building your machine. One is the accuracy that you envision. What is it that you want to do? Is it woodworking where you can live with maybe a little bit higher tolerances? Or are you thinking of machining metals like brass or aluminum? And another aspect is the spindle itself. Now, I cannot recommend the machines that hold a woodworking router as a spindle or as a tool that actually is doing the machining because one, you will wear the bearing out relatively quickly on that router and number two, it's really, really loud and the spindle is so much nicer. The spindle I have that you see mounted right there is a 2.2 kilowatt water-cooled Chinese spindle. And do you need 2.2 kilowatts? No, you can use a smaller one. What I liked about it is that it holds larger collets. And I was thinking at the time that I could use some of my router bits that I have in the CNC machine. Actually, I have never done that. I always bought specific tools. And those tools are usually relatively small. So if you machine something with a quarter inch or so, that would be most of the time what you will be using. Maybe you have a ball nose that is bigger or maybe you are planning off the spoil board and that would be a tool that is an inch in diameter. But most of the time the tools will be rather small. So you can get away with a much smaller spindle. But the spindle itself, I do really recommend that. And making it water cooled is good 
for one, it's quieter, and two, it can run for hours at a time, and you don't have to worry about it overheating. So my machine does not have an issue holding a tenth of a millimeter accuracy. So there's plus minus five hundredths of a millimeter for any woodworking project that is beyond what most of the tools in your shop can do. And even for metal cutting, that is very nice because your parts are going to fit very nicely together. Now, how does the machine achieve that? Well, number one is how is the axis driven? So in my case, that is a ball screw. There are two different types of ball screws that you can purchase. One is rolled and one is ground. And the ground being the more accurate one, I have the type or the version that is rolled. And that is plenty accurate for a hobby machine. The second item is how do we go from A to B uh, in the aspect of holding things? And that is the linear guide rail. So the axis slides on a linear guide rail instead of just a V bushing or a V bearing that rides on a piece of angle iron. Um, so I really, really recommend that you invest into the linear rails. And the next item is the motor itself that drives the axis. So when it comes to accuracy, you do need to have a certain momentum or torque in the motor so that you don't lose st steps when you consider a stepper motor. I do have a stepper, it's an open loop, so it does not know at what position it is at any given time, it just follows the commands. And if it would lose a step, nobody would know. Um, I have not had issues with that. The stepper motor that I use is a NEMA 23. That is the size of the motor. You can see the guy living right up there for the x-axis. Uh, the NEMA 23 is the size of the motor, basically the mounting holes and the dimensions. Um, the torque that it produces 3 newton meter, that's quite a bit, and that is 425 ounce inches. And with that amount of torque on a 5 millimeter pitch ball screw, I have been able to route or machine any project that I had in mind so far, and the accuracy is very, very good. When it comes to the electronics and software for your machine, there are a couple of things you want to think about. Uh, if you know nothing about it, well, let's start out very easy. There are three elements, three elements that you need to know. One is the CAD program. So that makes the drawing itself. And your machine or your software actually ultimately wants to use what it's called a vector. It's always a closed geometry. That graphic or that CAD can then be translated into a G-code. And that is usually called CAM, so the CAM module will have a certain post processor that is unique to your machine. So let's say it's Linux or CNC or USB CNC or whatever, there's thousands of them that you will find usually as a selection. But it's going to be unique to your breakout board in your machine. So the breakout board is what runs the individual axis and it's going to be manufactured by somebody. Uh, some company that offers it and I started out with Mach 3 that has a very simple breakout board um, Today there's Mach 4, but five years ago there was Mach 3 and I did not enjoy it It had a parallel board. I needed an old computer for that and there were several issues that I ran into later on so I scrapped all that and I bought a breakout board that is made by adding CNC in Holland and I absolutely love it. I would buy that again in an instant and I can really recommend it. It is very nifty, has a ton of features. It's very intuitive. You can use a touch screen with it if you like or just the mouse. Um, I like it as you can tell <laughs> and I would buy it again today. Now let's go back to the software here and the hardware that was a little bit intermingled. So you start out with a drawing that you make in some CAM, a KitKat package, CAD. Then you go over to the CAM package, which will run your geometry through a post processor with additional information that you give, for example, what tool you use, or is that a pocket that goes down and how deep does it go into the material? And that CAM package then will spit out a G-code. 
So that G code, it will be read by the machine controller. And that machine controller, as I said, in my case, is adding CNC out of the Netherlands. Now, that will make your machine and your axis move now forward and backward and uh, result into a part. Now, the next step is that you have to think about how to hold your part. And that is called the work holding. Let's talk about that next. So when it comes to work holding, the easiest way is to install a spoil board on your machine. And the spoil board is what you see right here. That is a piece of three quarter inch MDF. And in that you can just drive a screw right in and either throw the piece of wood that you might be holding um, or on the corner of it, you can set up a clamp. Now here um, I have a piece of aluminum right now that I'm holding and um, you can see that I have several clamps set up around it for machining. Now there are threaded inserts that I put into the MDF, which are metal threaded inserts and then just a quarter 20 screw and uh, these are work holding pieces right here but you can also machine those um, yourself very easy matter of fact i'm going to show you one so here are a couple of work holding clamps that i made this would make a perfect first project uh, if you are getting into a cnc router now you can see these are made of plastic they're made of delrin um, and they actually these have been left over but um, they have a step in the front just so you can put the clamp onto something. And then there's a quarter 20 screw that goes through with a washer and a little star knob on the top to tighten it. Um, very, very simple. And that would replace the one that you see right here. Um, don't have to buy anything. Um, that is a excellent way to clamp any project really to your work surface and the plastic clamp has another advantage uh, and that is if you route through it your cutter will mostly survive um, most likely survive and it will just make a dent in this in the work holding piece in the work clamp so big deal um, if you make this from steel or even aluminum if you're going really really fast then possibly you will break your cutter and there could be 20 or 30 or 40 dollars out the door when that happens. Machining wood, especially machining MDF, creates an enormous amount of dust. And right off the get-go, I think you want to invest or investigate some sort of dust collection system for your CNC router. Now I have iteration number four of a dust shoe that I'd like to share with you. And uh, I think for me, the most important thing is to make it easy to use. So think of how you can attach it and take it off very simple. Mine is held on by magnets so I can just grab it and take it off like so. Do a tool change and then come back and just it clicks back in place and that's all there is. Now when you do that a um, couple of pointers here. The magnet itself sits in a recess in the top plate, so that indexes it, it holds it on. Item number two is make those recesses deep enough and put enough magnets on there. The problem will be that the brushes have a certain amount of resistance. And if you go over a workpiece, what can happen is that the whole shoe comes off and that will most likely break your tool. So. When it goes into place, it needs to snap into place and stay there. So make it easy to use, make it so it stays in place. And the next item is that those brushes that everybody talks about, they are great for catching the um, wood dust inside so it doesn't go all over the place. But they leave too much air through. There's too much air going through right up here. So there's no suction anymore down here. So what I did is I placed another layer inside. This is actually some material that came off a belt, uh, an old belt. I don't know. I had that laying around in the shop. 
the version I had before I even liked better because I used some packing material. It was a foam material from the packing and I just used hot glue to put it inside of it. Now this thing here is probably two years old and still lives. Uh, it's great. And then if you make two of those, one with relatively long brushes, that would be this guy, and then maybe one that has half these brushes so you can accommodate uh, the different stick out on your tool that uh, I think would be a good accessory for your CNC machine. If you're coming from a woodworking background, then you already know about router bits. Those most likely that you have on hand will not suit your machine. They're just not made for that. Um, maybe you can get by using one or the other, but um, let's talk about the different designs that are most common in the use of CNC routers. So here are several different bits that I've laid out and my intention was originally to go through those and talk about the advantages of every single one of them. The problem is that this video is just going to get way too long and I know by now I've probably lost most of uh, everybody's interest uh, anyway. So um, these are quarter inch uh, cutting bits right here and that's just the diameter. This is uh, full carbide. They're actually all full carbide bits right here except these have inserts. So this is a bit that has carbide inserts and the V bit right here as well. It's also a carbide insert bit. Um, this is a very small bit right here that I use for lithophanes. This is a bit that I mainly use for cutting aluminum. This is a bit that has spectra coating on it. It's called a compression bit. And these two here are O flute bits, actually a down cutting and uh, up cut bit. And this is a wide side up cut two flute spiral bit. Uh, all of them have their particular purpose, but I'm not going to go into more detail. Uh, originally I planned to do that, but the uh, video is just getting way too long. I think I leave that for another day. I hope you got something out of this video. Uh, the next one will be about uh, minimum lubrication systems that I'm currently building and I hope I can take you along for that. Catch you next time.